Right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on fronosphoto.com, put your name, email address in it, hit send it. I'm gonna send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com, and this is a review of the Tamron 150 to 500 millimeter f5 to 6.7 Z mount lens. Now, I say the Z mount lens because we did a review of this type of lens, the 150 to 500 millimeters, for the Sony E mount a few years ago, but there's actually some differences between those two lenses, and I will tell you all about that when we get further into the review. But what did I photograph this time around? with this lens. Well, I took it out to a lacrosse match, which was done on an overcast day, which forced me to bump the ISO up of the Nikon Z9. The images turned out pretty well, but I didn't want anybody being like, oh, it's not perfect because you didn't shoot in the right light. Well, the next day I went back where it was a game at noon and it was bright and sunny. So I did that, but also the final thing that I photographed was at St. Joseph's University baseball. They had a home game outside. These guys aren't wearing helmets, so we have a better chance of getting sharper faces and sharper eyes. So that's what I shot, and I shot it all with the Nikon Z9. Now this Tamron 150 to 500 is the only third party super zoom lens available for the Z mount at the time of recording this. Now Nikon has two different native lenses, the 100 to 400, which is a Z lens, and the 180 to 600 millimeter lens, which I reviewed a little while ago as well. Those are the native options. This is the only mega zoom currently available that way. But let's take a look at the outside of the lens, talk about the feel, let's talk about the weight, and the first thing you notice is this is a heavy lens. When I was shooting with this, and I'm a strong guy, you can tell from my muscles, I'm strong. This is a heavy, awkward lens. And as you zoom it, it becomes even more awkward and less balanced, in my opinion, when using it in the real world. So let's talk about the weight. It weighs in at 3.79 pounds or 1.72 kilograms. The funny thing is that it's a half a pound less than the Sony E-mount version, which is interesting because usually I find that the Sony ones tend to be lighter, but I guess somehow Tamron was able to shave off some weight with this lens right here. Now for comparison, the 180 to 600 Nikon weighs in at 4.72 pounds or 2.14 kilograms. And my arm, speaking of kilograms, is starting to kill. Like, Stephen, I'm not even trying to flex and look at this muscle right here. You, I'm not even flexing. And it, this is how heavy the lens is. You could work out with this if you've got bird arms like Dan. Anyway, let's look at the outside of the lens. So we have a tripod collar right here that is removable and has an Arca Swiss plate built in, which is great if you're a birder. It's great if you wanna go on a tripod because then you have that already built in. You just pop it on to the tripod. Now I shot it without this. Um, it just, for me, I can handhold this, but it is awkward. And honestly, it would be even more awkward if you put it on a monopod because you put this on a monopod and it's just awkward when you try to zoom it. Why is it awkward when you try to zoom it? Because it's not exactly a loose throw, meaning, when I try to turn it, can I turn it with ease? With this, it's not that easy to turn it. Now, in one way, that's good because there is no lens creep. They got, they got rid of the lens creep, but it's not super easy. So you gotta crank it when you're trying to zoom it. And that, to me, is a pain in the butt. That I wish it was looser. Now, one of the things you can do is you can tighten it. What's this thing called again, Steven? Flex zoom lock. The flex zoom lock. So if I zoom out to 500 and I just wanna lock it, I'm gonna flex lock. It's not locking, I'm flexing, Steven. Why isn't it? Anyway, you go like this, now it's locked in there and you can't turn, well, you can actually turn it if you're strong like me. I'm turning it while it's locked in. The reason you would do that is say you wanna be at 500 millimeters, you know you don't wanna zoom, you can just push this out and lock it. I don't like this feature at all. I'd rather have some kind of lock switch for it um, because this, sometimes I find myself accidentally locking it when I'm trying to zoom. And if you do this too many times, more than two, you're not shaking it, you're playing with it. So you wanna be careful that you don't play with it too much. So here, as I turn it, you can see 
how large this lens gets. It just, it's a heavy lens. I'm gonna keep coming back to that time and time again. Now let's look at the filter thread. We have an 82 millimeter lens cap. So we have an 82 millimeter filter thread. You have your lens hood that pops on, bayonet style. You has nice rubber on the end, locks in like this, put it back out. I use it every time I'm taking pictures and I just gotta line it up straight. You gotta, it should just be easy to line it up straight. There we go and it clicks in and now it's on the lens. On the side of the lens, you have some switches. You have a non-linear slash linear switch. Now this is for those of you who wanna go ahead and manual focus. It's different ways and different speeds of doing the manual focus. Maybe that comes in handy if you're trying to video birds at a distance or just get track a bird like that. I try to rely on autofocus as much as possible, but you have that option with that switch. You have an AF to manual, you have your uh, distance limiter, when it comes to autofocus, but what you don't have is a VC option for turning off the vibration compensation. All of that is done inside of the Nikon body. These switches are different from what you find on the Sony. I'm not sure how they shaved off some of the weight, but that is the switches there. So you have your zoom ring we talked about. You've got your manual focus ring right here. That's normal. You've got your USB-C docking plug right here for those of you who want to update if you ever need to do that. And you have a lock on the back that only locks this lens in at 150 millimeters. So if we unlock it, I'm not getting any, I'm really not getting any, any creep. So I would prefer a looser throw over a tighter throw. Let me jump in here real quick because I wanna show you this photo taken with the Tamron lens and edited with Fropac 4, starting with C41, then we've got Copper Tone, DeLorean, Kaleidoscope, Saltwater Taffy, Thick with Three Cs, and Tintype. But check this out, exclusive to Fropac 4, we've got four custom adaptive presets called X1, X2, X3, and X4. Let me show you X1 in action. I go ahead and I click it, and then Lightroom's gonna do its thing. It creates a mask, and you saw that the skin already got smoother. But look at this, off, on, but let me click on masks because it's not just doing one thing, it's creating seven different masks with one click of a button. And let's say we want that face to soften a little more. We can raise the amount of softness. Let's say we wanna bring those eyes out. We can go up to iris and we can add more exposure to make them come out a little more. Look at the skin right here. We've got after and we've got before. What a major difference with this adaptive preset. So look, if you wanna speed up your raw workflow, give yourself a great starting point, or you're just tired of other people's presets sucking, we created 14 all new custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack4. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters, and if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you wanna get the Grand Slam bundle that includes Fropack one, two, three, and four, as well as the adaptive presets, and you can save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Now remember, this is a five to 6.7, so as you zoom, the, the aperture is changing. It's a variable aperture lens, so you need to always take that into consideration in the lighting situation that you're in. Because when I was shooting in that terrible light outside with the lacrosse, I had to bump the ISO up to 8,000 or 10,000 just to compensate for that 6.7. But where does the aperture change as you zoom? Well, at 150 millimeters, of course, you're at F5. At 5.3, you're at 190 millimeters. 5.6 is 275 millimeters. F6 is 350 millimeters. 6.3 is 400 millimeters. And at 6.7 is 475 millimeters. But now let's jump into some of the pictures because that's really what you're here to see. Um, remember, I shot with the Nikon Z9 in this situation, but this is a Z-mount lens, so it will work on your Z8s, it will work on any of your Z-mount cameras. So the first shoot that I did was that lacrosse game out at St. Joseph's University, and being that lacrosse players wear helmets, it's very difficult to see their eyes, but pre-game, their eyes are out because the helmets are not on during the national anthem. So this is what you see at 150 millimeters, and then when you zoom out to 500, this is how tight you can get get for a portrait. Now, I zoomed in on the eye, and this one looks like it's pretty good. I'm at 4,000 ISO, but it doesn't look critically sharp in my opinion. And I don't know if that's an issue with the lens 
or a, an issue with the Nikon focusing system. Uh, and I say that because with the 180 to 600 Nikon, I had no issues with the autofocus and I think that it was so much sharper and so much better that it leads me to believe that I, I just, I, you're gonna see with some other images that I got that it just didn't seem like it had critical sharpness. In most situations, most people won't notice a difference, but I do need to point out the differences between the native Nikon lens that seemed to be pretty good or much better than what I found with this Tamron. Now, when the game started, it was really overcast. There was a lot of rain that day and there was no sun out at all. So I'm bumping up the ISO to 10,000 in this case. I'm at 1 1600th of a second at 5.6. I 100% could drop my ISO a little bit lower and go to one, say 1,000th of a second, but I wanted to keep it faster because I was more interested in freezing the action because I didn't want some motion blur to tell me that, oh, it's motion blur and, and not focus. So I wanted to make sure it was nice and sharp. You can look at the background here and see that at 5.6, a lot of the background is more prevalent. It's more in focus. So that's one of the things you get when you're at 5.6 or 6.7. Also, in terms of aperture blades, you've got seven of those opposed to the 180 to 600 that has nine of them. If that matters to you, keep that in mind. But as we zoom in here, I think this one did pretty good. It's also harder to see at 10,000 ISO whether you are super duper duper sharp, and that's why I decided to go out for another game the next day, this time at Drexel University, because it was at noon and it was super bright and sunny, which also makes it a little difficult to see their face when the sun is hitting the helmet and in shade. But this time, the focus looked much better, tack sharp on this one. Now, I did run through a bunch of different focusing modes, trying to find one that, that locked onto the face better. There's the 3D tracking, there's the all-encompassing, there's the old dynamic area AF, there's the making the box smaller so that the Nikon knows to just look in this area, and I ran through them all trying to find the one that worked best for me in this situation. But I think this one looks really good. Um, this time we're at F six. So the background, yeah, the people are there, but they are blown out pretty well because they're at a distance. Continuing on, we've got some more action photos. We zoom in on the face. This one looks nice and sharp from a distance. So that's totally a good thing. The colors are fine. The, um, the contrast that I'm able to pull out of it because I added Kaleidoscope from Fropac 4 makes it look pretty good. But that critical sharpness, um, is a thing that is a concern for me. And also the awkwardness of using this lens as you zoom, it just feels like the balance is off. And that heavy aspect of it comes into play the more you handhold and the more you shoot. It's just awkward when you're trying to shoot and zoom because of how tight the zoom ring is. And that's why I'm not a big fan of how this thing zooms. And maybe that's why I was a little awkward with getting the shots I wanted to get and might have missed some of the things because I was fighting with the lens. Now inside of the Tamron lens, you do have their linear style motors, which is supposed to help give you faster focus. And it does give you fast focus, uh, it, but does it give you accurate focus? is the more important question. In some cases it did, and in other situations I felt that it just wasn't critically sharp, and that's what I'm looking for, especially when you look at the 180 to 600 from Nikon, that in my opinion is critically sharp more times than not. Now, because the players had helmets on, I knew I wanted to go shoot something else where players didn't have helmets on, and that's why I went out to a baseball game at St. Joe's University. It's a great place to shoot because I have clear shots of the mound, just like a photo, just like this, and we zoom in, and again, I'm only at 2000 ISO, and it just doesn't seem super duper sharp on the face. And yeah, I'm zooming in a little bit, but that's what I'm doing. I'm looking for that critical focus, in most situations, if we printed this, you'd never question whether it's in focus or not. But the next photo of the third baseman catching a ball, it's focused on the glove and not on the face. Now that's something that the Sonys, that's something that the, the Canons get right, is that they will find the face over the distraction of the glove but it also depends on which focus mode you end up using. Because I know from talking to Nikon shooters, they run through a lot of different focusing modes because some of them work better than the others depending on the sport that they're shooting. Let me jump in and say, do you like podcasts? Well, if so, we have a podcast called Frono's Photo Raw Talk, where we talk all things photography and sometimes get into things that aren't photography, AKA we go off the rails. To get our podcast, head on over to fronosphoto.com slash podcast or wherever you get 
get your podcasts like YouTube, Spotify, as well as Apple Podcasts. Now, let's get back to the video. Now, one of the issues I ran into with having an external zoom lens was this play at second base. The reason that my composition is not perfect here is when I was tracking the subject running, stealing the base from going from first to second, I was panning, panning, and I was zoomed out because I'm all the way out at 500. And I was trying to get close to the fence so that it wouldn't show up in my image. But as I panned to the left, I hit a pole. <laughs> and that caused me to not be able to follow through with the play. And by the time I rearranged myself and just started shooting, I ended up not with great composition. And also, it's not perfectly sharp here. Um, it's just not. It was a good play at second base, but because it was external zooming in this case and I hit that pole, that's a little bit on me, but also it didn't pick up that focus super fast once we reacquired the subjects. Now, I love trying to get good shots of the pitcher uh, where I have somebody in the foreground like the batter and the pitcher is out of focus just to show you some of the depth that you get. This pitcher had a really cool wind up. You can see the, the ball stretched out over the back. It's probably not good because good hitters will know where his fingers are on the ball and know that a curve ball is coming and then take him yard like way downtown, bang, um, but whatever. It makes for good photos as he's looking here. Um, you can just see, again, the distance of the pitcher throwing, the ball is out of focus, the batter and the umpire is out of focus. These are the angles you look for when you're trying to capture those moments. But also a, a quick tip is follow through on the play. In this case with the pitcher, I decided to go vertical. I took a bunch of shots as he was pitching and I followed through because the ball went right back up the middle to the pitcher. And that's why I was able to capture the ball almost going into his glove and then also bouncing off of his glove because I followed through the play. That's one of the mistakes I used to make is not following through the play. It's much cheaper because we're not shooting film. So it doesn't matter how many photos you take, it just takes a little longer to edit them. So how much is this lens? Well, it's a $1,200 lens. It's pretty expensive for what it is, but how much is the 180 to 600 Nikon? That one's 500 bucks more at $1,700. And then of course there's the 100 to 400, that's uh, another option, but that one's in the 2000 plus dollar range and isn't really comparable here, in my opinion, due to the price. But before I tell you who it's for and if I think you should buy it, two tests to run through. We got the wind tunnel test and the sniff test. Let's back up here and give it a huff and a puff and a blow. Ooh, I'm sorry. It's an extreme failure of the wind tunnel test. You failed the wind tunnel test. Let's sniff it. Oh my God. Steven, I haven't smelled a lens like this in a long time that gave me this note. Do you know what note that is? What? Yeah, don't buy it. <laughs> I, I haven't said that in a while. And I, I just, I did not like this lens. I haven't said that in a long time, and I'm sorry, Tamron. I, I, I didn't find that this was great, especially when you compare it to the 180 to 600, which yes, is $500 more and is larger, but I rather have the 180 to 600, and I rather have you guys save up your money to spend on something like that, even though it's slightly larger, weighs more, and is a little bit more expensive. It's just a better lens. I, there were just things I just didn't like. I just, I struggled with the focus and I thought it was the camera, but it really wasn't the camera as much as the lens. Some situations good, other situations not as much. 1200 bucks and, and $1,700, yes, $500 is a big difference. If you can swing it, I would save up and get that other lens. This is just a tough lens for me to recommend right now because I, I didn't feel it. I felt it over on the, the Sony side because the E-mount lens just worked better. And that was a couple years ago. It just focused better for whatever reason. So I don't know why that is. I hate to say it that I don't really recommend this one. If you do feel that you know it gives you what you need and yes, critical sharpness is important to me, but maybe I'm zooming in further than you might, it could be a good option if you're gonna shoot birds, if you're gonna do some wildlife stuff, if you wanted something that's smaller than the 180 to 600, this, this could be for you and you wanna save 500 bucks and it's not that big of a deal, it's good enough for you, then sure, we've got links down below where you can purchase it, that's for you to decide. But I'm here to help you just just to tell you what I think about it after using it in the real world. So that's it this time around, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Jared Poland, Frono's Photo dot com. See ya.